Hello, everyone. Welcome to the CG Spectrum and Side Effects webinar on how to future proof your skills using Houdini. I see we have quite a few people attending already. We have about 20 people so far. Um, feel free to use the chat if everyone wants to just say where they're from. I know we have quite a few people from all over the world. Um, so if everyone just wants to say hello and say where you're coming from, that would be awesome just to get the ball rolling in the chat. And um, in the meantime, I'll introduce our presenters. So we have Julie Lottering here from Side Effects. And Side Effects is the company who makes Houdini. And Julie is the director of education at Side Effects. Um, and so she's going to be joining us. She's going to be doing the main sort of bulk of our presentation, um, talking about how to future proof your skills and problem solve using Houdini. So I think you guys are going to really love that. And next, we also have Daniel Hurrigan, and he is our effects department head at CG Spectrum, and he's also one of our mentors. So some of you may recognize him already as, as one of your mentors here at the school. And yeah, he's a FX expert and we love to have him and he'll be talking a little bit about his experiences and what it's like to be an artist at a big studio and also what some studios look for when they're hiring students. So welcome everyone. Oh, we see some people from New York, France, London, Spain. Hello everyone, California. Wow, this is awesome. <laughs> Hi guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll say I'm from Toronto. Yeah, both both me and Julia are from Toronto. And oh, I guess I should introduce myself. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm Maxine and I am the career development manager here at CG Spectrum College. And I've worked um, in VFX for almost 10 years. And I'm I just started here about just over a month ago, and I'm here to help the students find their career paths, and hopefully get jobs when they leave CG Spectrum. We've got someone from New Jersey. Hello, hello. Awesome. Well, let's get started then. Um, Julie's up first, and she'll be talking about future-proofing your skills. Take it away. Fantastic. Julie. Thanks, Maxine. No problem. All right, I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, let's take a look. All right. And I know the eternal return is always so scary when it bleeps. Okay, here we are. Can everyone see? Yeah, I can see everyone in the okay. chat. Yeah. Nice. So I'm going to present, and you're welcome to put things in the chat. And um, Maxine, if you want to stop me if you think it's pertinent. Otherwise, I can take some of the questions up after. Yeah, yeah, no problem. We'll do a Q&A portion after this. Wonderful. So a little bit about me. Um, as Maxine said, I'm Julie Lottering. I'm the Director of Education and Training at Side Effects. And what does that mean? It means that I work with studios all over the world and help artists develop um, their skills in relationship to their creativity, um, help them understand the problems that they want to solve, and Houdini is one of the tools that we use to do that. Now, my background in um, uh, art and science came from long ago. Uh, my whole family, they're all artists and always love science. And I remember being six years old and coming to the breakfast table and they would ask me, my parents would say, um, Julie, what shape do you think the universe is? And I would kind of like, I'm not prepared for this question. Uh, but it really helped me think about the world in a much um, wider lens trying to imagine the shapes of things and the way that they all relate to one another. And that's where um, I think I believe that creativity is this huge gift and being a creative catalyst can actually change the world. So that's what I want to talk to you about today. So first off, this year, whether you just graduated or you will be graduating probably in a year is going to feel different. Uh, the world is in a crazy place right now with COVID. And rather than talk about things that um, you know you could do or don't address it directly, I really want to get to the heart of the matter and talk about how you can not just survive, but how you can thrive in this kind of world. 
So adaptability is this interesting um, trait. There were a number of psychologists, um, you know, behavior, uh, cognitive science scientists, all these different people, and we were asking them, what is the one trait above intelligence, leadership skills? What is one of the traits that really get people ahead? And they said adaptability. But if I was going to ask you, what is adaptability? How do you define it? Or what are the ingredients in adaptability? I would love to hear what you could say. And the, the scientists, the many people who study this have varying answers. But I think the three ingredients that um, they've agreed upon is flexibility and openness, critical thinking, and emotional regulation. So to be adaptable, you have to obviously be flexible and open to change. If you're not, if you're very rigid, there's no way you're gonna be adaptable. You have to be willing to participate in the changes to come. But critical thinking matters because uh, if you can't identify what has changed in their environment or how to change your behavior in relationship to it, um, you're only gonna get so far. And the third one here, emotional regulation. Emotional regulation is extremely important. It's probably the key to those other two things. But what is emotional regulation? Uh, if you're gonna say, well, Julie, you've just given me a riddle in the shape of an enigma. What is emotional regulation? Well, let me do my best to try to define it for you. So emotional reg regulation, or you, know, you could think of it like resilience, um, actually comes down to being able to balance yourself. And in the work environment, actually emotional regulation is so important. And we're gonna get there when it comes to attitude. But how do you expand your ability for this? Well, they did a large um, number of uh, studies around MRIs and what happens in a resilient brain. And one of the cool things is that there's two different parts of the brain that fire um, in the experiment that they were doing. They gave accounts of people who were escaping World War II and uh, you know, someone who stamped their passport to let someone escape someone who uh, was hidden by a neighbor so they wouldn't be found. And so these are somewhat, these are resilient people, but what they found it is that they're also grateful. And the two parts of the brain that were firing up relates to gratefulness. And actually, um, gratefulness is sort of a, a thick topic. It's actually composed of a feeling of uh, compassion for people who don't have what you have. It's a feeling of uh, decision-making, like some thing outside of your control helped in that situation, something beyond your ability to control, and dignity that you mattered in that instant. And I'm telling you this, I know this seems far from CG, but I'm telling you this because this is a life skill, that gratefulness can be an antidote to feeling frustrated, to feeling angry. Are you going to be able to do critical thinking if you are extremely frustrated? Are you gonna be open to change if you're feeling anxious? And so these are life skills that you can take into the studio with you, but this year, more than others, is probably going to be a year to work on your adaptability. So uh, one aspect I like to mention is in trying to be resilient or find gratefulness, you know, and it could be in a very overwhelming situation or, you know, you're sending out resumes for a long time and not hearing anything back, is just to step back and think about being task fo focused versus self focused. So if you're self focused, you might think, oh, what, is it me? Like, did I do this thing wrong? You know, if I'm getting a critique from a supervisor and I think, oh man, they cut the shot because I'm not good enough, um, you know, and I roll around that way, that takes so much emotional energy. But if I can come back to be task focused and I can say, you know, I sent out these resumes, maybe I need to get more feedback. Who can I get to give me more feedback on my reel? Or, um, you know what, I see the gap between this person's work and my work. How do I close that gap? Because I can see that what they're producing is what studios want, or that's the level that the studios are working. So your curiosity and your gratefulness can really be the structures 
to help you with emotional regulation and adaptability. And I'll say now that I am very grateful. We work in industries where working remotely and working on computers feels very normal and is possible. And I, I feel that for the people who can't do that. So that's COVID. And that's to say that job hunting is gonna be different. Um, job fairs are gonna be different. Uh, how you onboard in a new company, how you get recognition from a supervisor, all those things are gonna be changing. And if you're still a year away from graduating, this is a great sort of this is stuff to think about ahead of time. Well, we'll get there. So, but I do want to say like looking for jobs and getting ready for the industry, future proofing your skills is hard typically. Um, and it's partially because antiquated advice is everywhere. You know, our industry is changing so fast. You know, if someone's been in the industry seven years, it's a very different landscape that you're entering into than they are. And so they might give you advice based on things that no longer apply, um, their very finite experience of how they found a job, and it might not be related to your goals. So if you ask someone about finding a job, it's a good sign when they ask you questions about your goals. If they say, well, do you want to work at a big studio or a small studio? You know, what kind of uh, problems do you like to solve? If they just say, here's how you do it, remember that they're going to give you the path that they walked. Also, what's difficult is um, what companies want vary. So I have students who ask me, you know, Julie, should I be more technical or more creative in my reel? Um, and I was at a, a meeting with Ubisoft not too long ago, and in the same room were two experts who had totally varying opinions. One said, you know, you can never train the artistic eye, that's always what I want first. And the other person said, you know, I can never train a technical a curiosity. And that's what I want first. So the truth is that like no one has decided it yet. There are varying opinions. Um, and that means that it's not an easy question to answer and probably something that you have to reflect on for yourself. The other one here is real feedback is hard to get. So um, if you give someone a version of your reel to look at, oh, there's so much pressure in that moment. They have to try to say something encouraging, something constructive. Maybe you don't know if they're really giving you their opinion about the reel at all. So one thing that I recommend is you can A, B test. So you can give a reel to someone with a shot in it or without a shot in it, uh, with a shot cut longer or shorter. And you can say, which one do you like better? And if I've shown that to 10 people and you know eight of them say, um, version A, well then I know that's pretty good feedback. And there isn't just one way for your career to unfold. That's what makes this kind of thinking about your skills and where you're gonna fit in a little bit difficult. But there is tactical advice that I can give you that uh, I know will help you along the way. First, it is to picture your career as a painting, not as a ladder. So if I was gonna picture it as a ladder, I would think, oh, I wanna be a junior modeler, then I wanna get into this, and then you know, and then I wanna be a soup, or in effects, it might be, you know, I'm gonna start as a junior effects artist and I'm gonna uh, make my way up to be an effects TD. But maybe along the way, you don't wanna manage people. Maybe you don't want to be um, removed from the creative steps. And you know, maybe that's just not where you get your foot in the door in the beginning. So I like to think to myself, what are three themes I'm curious about? So um, my background is in neuroesthetics. What happens in the brain when you see something beautiful? And uh, But I knew, regardless of what I did, that there were three things I was always cu curious about. I was interested in education because I thought learning is one of the greatest contributions that I can make. I wanted I was interested in creativity. I wanted to elevate the levels of creativity in the spaces I'm in. And I wanted to do something global, international, where I could use the languages I learned or um, try to understand uh, a wider scope of norms and people. And so I could always keep developing one, if not the other. So if I got a job in education and teaching, then I could still be making art or artistic tutorials on the side or I could still be moving to another country and practicing that language. If I got a job doing something international, I could teach in my spare time. 
So I could always be developing these three things until today, I'm very lucky to be able to do all three of them. But I'll tell you, you know, when I graduated in, this is gonna date me, in 2008 with a graduate degree in neuroaesthetics. Oh, I mean, it was pretty niche then, it still is. There were not a lot of jobs to be found. And so this day, I had to engineer my own opportunities. And this, remembering that I can fill in different parts of the picture and have faith that it'll come together and that these diverse skills that I have will put me in a better position to take advantage of many opportunities that kept me alive. So this is kind of a tough one. Um, you can't get experience without having experience. Or like sad trombone, it's always the case. So how do we get around this loop? What's the loophole? Uh, internships versus projects. So a lot of people will take an internship route or if you're lucky to get a junior position, fantastic. Um, both internships and even school projects give you the chance to speak about your experience as though it's professional. But I really try to promote this idea of a project that you can find and put out into the world um, that might be useful to a general audience. So you make your own assignment. So I'll give you an example. We had a student who was working in class and he saw a number of other teams um, taking super long to make feathers. You know, and they were sculpting them and it was taking so long and feather placement was difficult. So he decided after he graduated, he was going to take this problem and he was going to make a feather generating tool. And he made the tool and he posted it up um, on his website, actually, you know, this, on our gallery, on the, on the side effects gallery. And within a week, he had about five interviews. So this was better than experience. He solved a real problem that people needed solving and happened to work with um, a platform like Side Effects to get attention for what he was doing. But, you know, lots of people can post something on ArtStation and get noticed. So you can make your own experience valuable if you're listening to and have a pulse of real problems that people need solving. So, as I mentioned, there's this sort of reshaping of how things are being done, and that is the recruiting conferences, job fairs, so, and interviews. So we have, you know, how you can uh, talk about experience, whether or not you have it, but this one, this one is key, cultivating mentorship. So, you know, I've been to SIGGRAPH and GDC, and at those job fairs, you have about a 15-minute window to connect with someone from the industry and they are seeing people all day. It is a blur to them. But if you can cultivate mentorship with someone who's invested in what you're doing, um, give you real advice, you'll have so much more time and a richer experience. But the first rule to mentorship is never use the word mentor. <laughs> that is like asking someone to be your friend. You, you don't use the word. It depends if it develops. You can't demand someone to be your friend you can't demand or ask someone really to be your mentor. It's a relationship that is uh, something that becomes. So what I would do, and this is actually um, just before I graduated, about two months before I was graduating, I um, just started with two contacts that my teacher gave me and someone else gave me. And I decided I'm gonna give myself an assignment. I'm going to try to have coffee, and it could be virtual coffee, with two people a week. And so I started with these two contacts and uh, I had a set of questions that I was gonna ask the same person each time. And it was about their experience and how they started and why they started at that size studio and the jobs they did and what do they wish they knew now? Um, what, uh, what do they wish they knew now? What are the employees that really stand out to them or colleagues that stand out to them? You know, hear about how they even talk about their own strengths and skills because it's so smart when you can pick up those nuggets and say, that person was really humble, but highlighted something important there. And I, have, I would have this list. And at the end, I would always ask them, is there one or two other people that you could introduce me to? And that got me to the next week. And all I needed was two more introductions or one more from each of those people to make sure that at the end, I had two months worth of interviews. And I would ask them something like, hey, look, this reel is in progress but can I show you where I've got so far and then maybe when I'm done, I can show you the finished reel. 
like everybody said yes. And I could also, it had them be invested. And so even in the midpoint of my reel, if they gave me some advice and I could work that in, I could point it out later. Like I've got the skills to listen, to take feedback and integrate it. And you never know who they know, but that kind of familiarity that you can work up in that time and how you can have a tribe full of mentors, even if you meet them once, if you have coffee with two mentors a week for two months, that is an amazing database of insight. And what you'll hear from them will prepare you. So this is um, one way to future-proof your skills is to get the right kind of, um, to get varied uh, viewpoints and to get people interested in your journey. So um, what are you going to say about you and what are you going to show? Uh, that's the second part. So that's a little bit of a how to get noticed with your experience, how to cultivate mentorship, um, why things are typically hard. But when someone asks you about you and how you want to see yourself in the industry, what are you going to say? So the first thing is I would ask myself this question. What trends are happening in the industry? And that could be, you know, um, virtual production. That could be universal scene description. That could be, um, you know, AR, VR still developing, machine learning, proceduralism. And I would say at the bottom of all those things, in film and games, there's one question that everyone's working on, which is how do we make beautiful things faster? That is the heartbeat of the industry. And that means things have to be reusable, they have to be revisable, and they have to be scalable. How do we make beautiful things faster? There's one question you remember from this talk, it's that one. It's gonna come in handy. Here's an example. So if you are talking about Solaris, this is uh, the new tool set in Houdini, a new piece of architecture that allows you to take things like dynamics that you guys might know from effects, but now we're using things like our physics solver in object placement. And so this is a really cool trend of where dynamics is being used to create greater realism that is revisable, that's scalable, and that feels faster, right? So this um, actually came out almost a year ago, but I'll tell you, the studios are calling me now asking for training on Solaris. And that's because pipelines take a long time to change. In fact, um, you know, a lot of the time as a student, you're probably working on the newest version of the software, and you're probably ahead of studios. So the knowledge that you have here on, hey, maybe I'm an effects artist, but I also know how to navigate and do some of this placement, and maybe I know how to use dynamics in um, other contexts. That is a rich and diverse skill. And it might be that you start at smaller boutique studios, so um, having a wider skill set shows a lot of promise. This is like kind of an oldie but a goodie, because I always think, how do we make beautiful things faster? the first thing is you have to prototype and you have to be able to try a number of ideas quickly. Um, here's an example of our uh, open street map data. Maybe you guys have seen this. Um, if you can find a way in your reel to show this kind of prototyping or quick solutions here, if, for those of you guys who don't know it, what's happening is we're using open street map data, bringing it into Houdini. A lot of the curved geometry is brought in as well. So you have this kind of landscape that you can play with. My colleague Louise is actually, he lived in Austin, so he's just saying like, oh, okay, well, maybe instead of the Grand Canyon, I want a suburb, so I'm gonna extrude the buildings here and see what I have. Um, and if I wanted a tidal wave through it, that would be awesome. If I wanted to explode something, that would be great. Or here's New York City. You know, you get lots of beveling with the buildings. Um, in fact, it's so much data, we actually have to do these sort of like drop-down menus so that you can select if you want primary, tertiary, what kind of roads you want. Um, but what this demonstrates is some quick thinking, quick solutions, um, being able to pose different um, variations without uh, in an ideation phase. The other question I would ask myself is um, what tools are being used for what jobs? So I'm going to show you some data that um, we're updating some of it. Uh, we take an annual survey, so the survey is actually going to be launched in September. So you're getting a little bit of the older data, but I still think it's useful. 
how are film studios using Houdini? So if you look at the first few things here, rendering, scene out, layout, lighting, dynamics, a lot of that is effects. And our bread and butter has been effects for about 30 years. Um, but the DNA of Houdini was always proceduralism because um, effects artists got their shots last or late <laughs> and uh, they would have to still make a lot of changes quickly. And so it needed to be procedural. It needed to be flexible to their design. Um, and, and so still to this day, if there's a drought of effects artists. Um, my job only exists because studios really need Houdini skills. Uh, and so even though there's a lot of representation there, there's still this thirst for effects artists. And you can think about all the TV shows, all the commercials that have a greater amount of effects and how that's growing. What's interesting here is crowds and character effects. So the studios say, well, they're currently using about 50% or you know 35%, but they would like to be using it like 80%. And when I asked the studios, well, what is with that gap? Like what's, What's going on here? Um, they'll say, well, uh, we, don't, we can't find those skills. So some of these tools um, were developed you know, uh, more recently. And so there's in-house training that would have to happen. But also, a lot of schools don't necessarily teach character effects or crowds. And so um, they're not graduating with those skills. So if I'm right now, if I were you taking notes, I'd be like, OK, so the job gap is the dark blue. <laughs> The dark blue is where they really need those skills. And so I see that in crowds and character effects quite a bit still in motion graphics. I see that in modeling. Um, and the big one that's not represented here, but will be in our survey, is that since we launched Houdini 18 um, after the survey last year, in I think it was November or October, lighting isn't on here really. But um, that is a huge change because of universal scene description. If you don't know what that is, you should look it up. Um, but basically, Pixar created a new file format so that there's a universal way for things to be communicated. So it's not just these stopping blocks. You know, a modeler sends this file to someone else, and if there's a problem, it has to get sent back. It's actually a live way of working on things. So there's a lot of changes here and a lot of need. And uh, for games that exist too. So we have tool development, prototyping concepts. Um, a lot of that would be tech art. A huge need for tech art. Um, I'll give you an example. A studio said to me the other day, we have five tech artists who know Houdini and we can prove that we make, um, there's 40% efficiency with the work we do in Houdini. But if the environment artists, which might be 30 artists, had even a little bit more proficiency in Houdini to create digital assets, then we could have 70% more efficiency than our workflow currently is. So this tool making, uh, digital assets, um, really high value in games. But what's also interesting is you see effects is really high in games. So they're stealing a lot of those skills from the film side. So there continues to be this blank space. So that gives you a bit of an idea of if you're if you're going to learn thin, some things on the side or do some special projects, those are some interesting directions to take them. And if if you're thinking about effects, the cool new part, if, if you're going to sell yourself, if you're going to think about what's going to stand out, it's art directability with proceduralism. So here we have material-based fracturing. And that's a really cool way to have something that kind of has a process built in because of the nodes that we have and operators we have, but an art directability as well, where you can change and almost in the viewport work on these lines so it really is able to express what you want. And so that art directable proceduralism, gosh, if you can hang on to that phrase, that is such a good one for you to take with you. The other question I would ask myself is, um, what tasks are taking the longest or are most complicated and how can I make them efficient? So art directable proceduralism is sort of part of the beautiful things you can make and then how do I make them more efficient? So sometimes it can be with rendering times and we can talk a little bit about that, but sometimes it can be with this kind of, this is not a glamorous skill, but a super important one, like 
streamlining processes. So a few years ago, if someone was going to use photogrammetry, they'd be really jumping in and out of a lot of packages. And we um, spoke with our studios and we made it so that the entire mesh pipeline for photogrammetry could be done in Houdini. That is a huge efficiency gain. And if you think about a studio like um, uh, Microsoft, they may have thousands of assets that they have to remesh. Uh, so this is a small example, but if you can find things in your workflow, on your reel, or in those conversations with mentors, where you can show these efficiencies. I find often they're easier to talk about in conversations than on a reel, which is why those kind of uh, int informational interviews are very valuable. Uh, it shows a kind of thinking about the team and um, the production side, like what a studio is there as a business, that's helpful, even if you're an artist. Yeah, this is the sparse pyro solver you guys may have seen or you might be digging into soon. Um, so for those of you who don't know, how this works is basically um, uh, anytime you use fluids, it can be very data heavy. So if you want to make something faster, what we're doing here with the sparse pyro solver is just calculating the active uh, region of the voxels. So this active region gets calculated as it goes. And so you actually have an entire different time. So here, what, what do we save? Like two hours when it comes to per, uh, for the frames, for the rendering. So these, again, like these are tools that we released like a year ago. Studios are still learning them. On the effects side, if they can see you thinking about optimization as well as realism, as well as art directability, you have a huge advantage. The hard thing, I think, is that a lot of people in this industry, um, starting out or even many, many years later, have imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome is kind of like when you feel like you don't know enough or maybe you snuck in behind the door, in the back door, or like people are gonna find out that you really don't know as much as you should or that you're, you shouldn't be there. And being self-critical is part of being an artist. I remember I was, I had a time when I was being so critical of what I was making that um, I asked a friend, I said, you know, if you had a fight between the artist and the, and the art critic, who would win? And he said, Julie, that fight would never happen because they should not be in the same place at the same time. And I really, I really love that. I still think it's, it's got a lot of truth. I mentioned this because I think it's important to understand that a beginner's mindset has an edge. When you're just graduating from school or you're going into this year, you get so much time to experiment. And even though you may not be an effects artist for 10 years, you have probably some newer version of the technology at your fingertips. You are not stuck on workflows that might be old. You can be inventing new things based on the new inputs and tutorials and information that you have. And it's really, uh, this kind of became clear to me. Uh, we were running a mentorship program for artists that were two to six years in their career at a studio. And we found that there was actually like a rusting that happened and an erosion of their confidence because they had twice as many shots. They had um, busier personal lives. They couldn't just uh, binge the software on the weekend or work after hours. They were already a lot of time at work. And so they were repeating workflows that felt safe and um, they were settling on something that was less creative. And so they had to find a way to keep pushing themselves. But for you, you know, you don't have the same uh, pain of change that those artists might have. And it's a, it's a huge value. So I think this is an important point. Um, Self-evaluation versus performance. Um, when, uh, if you've ever, oh, hang on, have, have you ever been to like an open mic or something and someone's just like jamming on the guitar and they are not good and you think like, are they just sharing their process or are they where they want to be with their skills? And a lot of research suggests that they think that they're amazing and they're not sharing their process like they think they've made it. And uh, may, maybe they have, but there is this gap often between um, the performance and where we evaluate yourself, ourselves. 
And sometimes it can be that we over-evaluate ourselves relative to what we're actually doing to perform. And imposter syndrome is the opposite. There's this, we undervalue our performance constantly. And as I said, like that may seem healthy, but the emotional weight and toil that goes into some of that anxiety is probably some wasted energy. So how do you write the course? And actually, um, task analysis is the, the cure. If you can analyze the task, and sometimes that is an emotional one with um, being task focused instead of self focused or grounding yourself or finding a way to be resilient. Um, that is going to equip you um, to close that gap. And you can do it also with your curiosity. So if I get negative feedback, you know, maybe I can be very curious about it and be like, oh man, I really was missing that. I need to know that's the missing piece. Now, if I know that, then I can do this way better, then I can get a whole different realm of realism. And, you know, knowing your strengths and <laughs> either being curious about your weaknesses, but knowing your strengths and developing a way to talk about it is part of not just selling yourself, but future-proofing your skills so that you uh, leverage them. And it takes a lot of reflection to know actually where you can contribute to a team. So uh, that idea, like what kind of problems do I really like to solve? And that might be different from the problems that I'm good at solving or that are easy for me to solve. And it might be important for you to know both. Like, hey, those, that stuff's really easy. That's not where I like to spend my time, but it's good to know that I have traction there. And this answer prepares you for that career as a painting. Because if I thought to myself, well, you know, I'm a really good modeler. Um, that just keeps me in one container. But if I think to myself, like, I really like to create um, things that can be repeated with diversity and um, that really captures uh, finite details uh, that make something come to life. That's a different answer. That's a totally different answer. What mindset puts me in a place to be coachable or take feedback? Um, now, that may not seem like a Houdini-specific skill, but I think that this is a really important one. I worked with students who, at the beginning of their projects, oh man, it was such a beautiful process. They were open, there was ideas being generated, it was this like really great moment to combine forces. And that tells you sort of when you need to put your foot on the, the pedal to kind of go fast and embrace the teamwork at that point. I also had other students who, you know, two weeks before the assignment was due, we would sit down and look at where they're at and they'd say, you know what, it's just not what I wanted. And, but I'm going to put in the work. I'm going to risk it. I'm not going to settle. I'm going to risk it and I'm going to make sure in two weeks I can pull it off. And that's also a beautiful mindset. Knowing where you are, in many ways, if you can speak about your mindset, the problems you're trying to solve, it's a far more sophisticated way to develop those mentorship relationships, but also um, the skills that you can see uh, you want to foster and build upon in a studio. How do I make troubleshooting feel like fun? Um, well, that one can be like, uh, someone would say, well, you know, it's when my, my, my peers get stuck. Then I sit next to them, we open up the network editor and we're going through and we're really making sure we can find what's, what's gone wrong. Or it might be, I put on my war paint and I go to the documentation and I read, 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 read until I find the solution. How do I make it easy for others to work with me or my files? Um, you know, sometimes we get files from industry and I'll tell you that um, like very tidy files is not necessarily a production skill. Uh, it, but boy, if you have an organized network and people can work with it, that is a huge benefit. Um, one of the skills that studios say is that um, students haven't learned to work with other people's files. They're used to creating their own file, having their assignment, and that's the end of it. But they're not putting the thoughtfulness to this being something that gets handed off. Um, and so that kind of skill, which is more subtle than just being able to make, um, you know, something for your reel, and it's hard to show off, is a consideration, at least in an interview or conversation, um, that you can make. So I want to talk about like how to show this a little bit on your reel, some of these skills. And um, 
go back to proceduralism, which, you know, started off actually with modeling with animation. So just like a pottery wheel, you're modeling clay with animation, with something that's turning. That was sort of one of the beginning points of um, people using proceduralism in, in a unique way. And again, this kind of combines animation with modeling. And so it's, um, it's still in its nascency. And I'll show you some ways that it's being developed. But um, modeling with animation sort of came about. And procedural assembly now is sort of another extent of of proceduralism where you know you have these pieces that you're not going to make everything procedural you're going to have them snap into place and what this shows this is an example of working with a team and saying like i want to solve problems that have scale and that can work with um, be efficient and uh, use existing assets to make something new so i'm going to take these pieces and find a way to create wild cards on this building and then I can snap them into place, but I can also, um, thinking about teams, um, allow hand uh, overrides or hand place placement for overrides. And this is an example where all those things that I mentioned about thinking about your strengths, um, you can talk over your reel and uh, like if you're showing it to someone and mention all those things. And it makes it not just like, hey, I click these buttons. But it's like, I was thinking about how this could be a huge contribution to the team, um, use things that were there. It becomes an emblem to represent those other strengths. So one of the secrets to success um, is attitude. You know, uh, I had someone from Double Negative tell me, um, you know, Julie, students who are coming out now, they know twice as much software, three times as much as I did when I was graduating. But the most difficult thing in hiring a junior artist is their attitude. And so the advice that he gave was don't marry your work. And you'll notice that self-focused versus task focus coming back in here. It's being team focused. You know, this is VFX games. They're all um, a, a team sport. You know, it takes a, a village really to make some of these things and it's unbelievable. But uh, you have to be flexible if some part of your work changes, if um, all of a sudden there's a reorientation. And that might be the feedback you get is that your shot's going to be cut. And that might be because the director's wife likes the color green and something else is going to take that. It may have nothing to do with your work. But if your focus is there's no shot too small and I'm doing this for the team and that's what the team needs, that's an entirely different attitude. And that requires being really humble and again, being grateful for the chance to work on this. And sometimes your shot's gonna be amazing and get front, you know, uh, be, be seen. And other times there's gonna be changes and it's gonna be difficult and that's inherent to the creative process. So, you know, when you're thinking about these skills, don't just get a job, but I would say be a cultural leader. And I'll give you this example. Um, we had a student who, uh, was doing an internship at Blue Sky. So he had, it was like his last semester, part of it was an internship and he'd come back for the last couple of weeks to finish a project. Goes to Blue Sky and um, they had been working on proprietary software for 13 years for fur and grooming. And uh, the student was like, oh, well, I don't know your proprietary software. Do you mind if I do some of this in Houdini? And they're like, sure. And so he's playing around and they're like, wait a minute, but that like, you're doing that super fast. How are you doing that? And he starts to show them and they say, can you just give like a presentation to the team? He gives this presentation and they're like, okay, we, we've got some thinking to do. Uh, the student goes back to school and Blue Sky calls us and they say, Julie, can we have training for our entire fur and grooming department? We're switching over. So the student actually triggered an entire turnover in that department. And when he came back, when he was out of school, um, side effects gave him a commercial license, which was great because then he could go into the studio with his own license, but also make work on his own. And um, he actually was hired into a higher level position because he knew, was more familiar uh, with Houdini than most of the other artists there. So, you know, you have this, this um, so much ability to actually change things when you're out of school. So a couple of pro tips when working with recruiters and hiring managers um, is 
that if you say you know Houdini, um, one of the first questions that they'll ask you is what part, you know, and hopefully they ask you. If they don't ask you, they're thinking it because it's a huge piece of software and can be used in all these different ways. So for you, if you're going to be developing the skills and then speaking about them, um, you have to find a way to quantify it. So I might say something like, I understand solvers that work across a pipeline, or I've worked with all these different contexts in Houdini. I might say I have 200 plus hours of instruction and project time in Houdini. And that, again, compared to their artists who might be learning it on the job in you know, whichever department, might be a whole lot more than they have. You can talk about reduced rendering times, or if you do some procedural modeling, you know, how someone from a studio would, would tell me about it is they'll say, well, I um, had this procedural modeling and it basically saved, it took 20 minutes to fix after there was a change in the project versus six days to rebuild. You can talk about um, naming conventions and uh, pipeline efficiency. And again, these don't have to be your main skills, but if you talk about it in this way, it already feels like you're, you're part of the problems that people are thinking of in the industry. So I'm presenting your reel. So for anyone who's going to this semester, you can think about what it means to make your reel in advance. And for anyone who's just an alumni, you can think about polishing your reel um, or, or what it means to send it. I know there's a ton of work out there or advice. And there's two things that I want to mention. One is follow instructions. So when I speak with recruiters, they'll say, oh, we get you know 300 um, applications in a day for this for this role and if anyone has given a reel that's more than the time we need i just don't look at it it's the best way for me to filter it and i just always think they might be missing the perfect person for the job so just be really sure to read those instructions the other one is only use your best work and well why why do we say that um so when I make that distinction between um, performance and self-evaluation, that's not something people talk about often, but it comes into play here. So if you have a piece of work where you just thought, oh, I'm gonna add more to my reel, it's not my best work, but I'll show it just so it sees, they can see that I've done something with it. It actually reveals that you may not have the judgment to analyze the task of what it means to do that shot well. And so it plays against you because your judgment and that gap between performance and self-evaluation self is revealed. So that's why A-B testing your reel, really making sure it's your best work, even if it's shorter, is the way to go. So uh, alumni license. So for those of you who are graduating, because you're part of our certification program and one of our partners, you um, are able to get a commercial license for six months for effects or one year for Houdini core, which is you still have access to fur and grooming and lighting tools and um, a lot of the core package. Um, or you have effects, which is, uh, I mean, all the bells and whistles, really the most powerful license we have. So you have those two options. For those of you who are going to school, that means that when you graduate, you'll have the option of those two license. You can take them to a studio when you go. And I really recommend that if you pick up this license and you are doing interviews or speaking with studios, tell them that you have this. Um, it's kind of a big cultural change. A lot of our customers were doing the work to remind them and tell them. Um, but if you tell them, uh, I know that it'll make a difference mm -hmm. just in some of their uh, considerations. Okay, last thing here is, uh, you know, if I was going to try to think about the difference between a million versus a billion, these are such big numbers for humans, or at least for me, it can be hard to know what makes them different. Mm -hmm. um, a million, if we were going to take it per second, so a million seconds would actually be equivalent to 11 years. But a billion seconds um, would be equivalent to 30 years. And so right now, in the position you're in, you're a time billionaire. <laughs> you have lots of time to develop your skills. And just like you might make an investment early, there are skills you can build that they, over time, they are going to 
um, yields great results and you can't make up the time, you can't make up those skills. And so when we're thinking about proceduralism and you can see how Houdini is being used in the studios, you can see the level which proceduralism is taking over there and um, every studio needs it across the pipeline. There are huge gaps still. Environment artists, most of uh, many, many film studios right now are calling us to help their environment artists, their layout artists. Um, so effects is a beautiful wanted skill. Many, many people need it. But if you know Houdini, there's still this flexibility into other parts of the pipeline. And the skills that you understand about dynamics, that also you'll probably see um, is used across the pipeline, whether it's for fur and grooming or for modeling or for um, placement, like I showed you with that Solaris video. So you are a time billionaire. You have the time to make the investment to these skills. And uh, I'm excited to see what you guys do. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me talk with you and for listening uh, to How to Future Proof Your Skills. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. OK, there we go. That was great. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you. Um, so just yeah. moving on to um, Daniel's portion here. I'll just start with a couple of questions just to get the ball rolling. Um, I know you mentioned um, Julie crossover with some departments and you know how handing things off it, or, or is really important. Um, Daniel, do you think if there was more crossover with other departments that would be helpful as an effects artist working with film if they weren't so segregated in their boxes? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, I mean, you know, at the studio I usually work at, which is Method VFX in, in Melbourne, um, I think I, I found when other departments were starting to pick up Houdini, you get this kind of cross-pollination of ideas and you can all sort of try and work out problems. Um, and everyone has their own way of solving problems. And I think when you get different departments working together and if they're all working in the same software, then you can kind of come up with these creative solutions. Um, and, you know, I, I had people coming from all sorts of different departments to me to ask, oh, could I do this in Houdini? You know, a rigging, a rigging department saying, oh, how do I, you know, could I do this? I can do this in Maya, but it's maybe a little clunky and a little slow. Could Houdini tackle this muscle jiggle or something like that? And you can sort of talk with them about it and, and the options that they have and maybe even show them how to do something simple. They don't need to understand the entirety of Houdini to make this one thing work. Um, so I think I think it's a really you know it's a really good environment if you can get that happening um, those different departments all with different ways of working and different ideas to uh, to sort of come together and, and you know try and solve problems together rather than being completely separate um, which is traditionally the way that it works um, but that that kind of uh, you know that does require them to to be on board with using Houdini and and it definitely is increasing I mean um, you know the modeling department the layout department and and even the reading department that that use and that pickup of Houdini has just been increasing every year which is which is great because it is so flexible that's that's the beauty of it um, yeah I think I, I think even in in the effects department you know we we tend to receive tasks that aren't necessarily effects either um they they may just be something ambiguous or difficult that they can't really place within one particular um discipline within the studio so you know it might be something like a, a virus or, or something on, on a character it's not really a building exploding or something being set on fire maybe it sounds more like modeling or texturing but there's a lot of complexity to the effect and you know, it's it's one of those sort of things where you may have to then talk to lots of different departments and come up with a unified approach. Um, th those kind of things are really fun. I think you know they they're not specific effects tasks, but they require you to solve you know a lot of complicated problems. And uh, having Houdini as as your main tool for doing that is, you know, it makes it a lot easier. I before I was using Houdini, I I was using 3D Studio Max and um for for a long time and it be, i got to the point with that uh that i just would hit a wall i would always hit a wall and i i couldn't 
I couldn't do, you know, I couldn't push it beyond and I couldn't do that note. I could try and maybe paint it out in comp or something. Um, but since moving across to Houdini, yeah, several years ago, the, you know, the walls just, they aren't there. You do hit walls occasionally, but you can, you can climb them. You just need to figure out how. Um, so I think having all those different ideas and different people from different departments trying to work those things out, it, um, it just leads to, you know, greater creativity and, and greater problem solving. Mm -hmm. And speaking of problem solving, um, do you think there are any like really common problems that you see at some of the studios that you've worked at, like something that maybe our students could focus on or, or people watching today, like maybe a, a skill that you see come up so much that it's like, okay, other people need to know this. <laughs> uh, it, it's a hard one. I think, you know, there, there aren't lots of problems that I see that, that Houdini can specifically solve outside of effects, but, but quite often um, we will use it to process meshes and like julie was saying about the kind of um asset pipeline how they unified that to be all inside of houdini uh, i mm -hmm. think that is definitely a big one where we can take very complex meshes maybe it's photogrammetry data which is huge in in the film pipeline um you know that that is everything we get from the set all of the photographs and scan data we can use houdini to process that and um you know turn it into usable data so that that might be something that that gets passed to someone in the effects department because they're well versed in houdini um to to process those meshes and make them usable it even may be something that you get given and you're like oh, i can't destroy this building it's just a, a scan with no you know no back to it or anything so you might have to work out ways to process that geometry and turn it into something useful um, right. The other things I, I guess I could think of is processing animation using um, the, there's a tool set in Houdini called Chops, and it's not something that's used very often, but occasionally it can be really useful in fixing some complex kind of animation issues, maybe removing jittering from an animation or fixing camera problems. Um, that's definitely something that Houdini can do really well. Um, mm -hmm. I think apart from that, yeah, like I was saying before, you know, people that know Houdini tend to get given those those things that don't have a place and those problems that, that other departments can't solve. Um, so it may just be some sort of complex task that really involves lots of different disciplines, but, but it falls on the effects artist because they tend to be the most kind of flexible and capable because they know lots of different things um they can you know model they can do effects they can render they can light they can comp um quite often i mean it depends on the studio but um quite often i find effects artists you know they they tend to be able to do quite a lot more than than other disciplines um so I, yeah i think you know yeah whatever the whatever the problem might be an effects artist hopefully usually can, can try and figure it out um, yeah, yeah more I, versatile I really for sure any, yeah i can't really think of any other specific ones sorry no 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 i, I think that's actually a, a good point because i've seen it happen as well at some of the studios i've worked at it, it's it's something that you almost can't plan for it's something that comes up and it's something that, oh my God, all of a sudden we have this crazy deadline. How can we do this faster? Like what Julie said, how can we make something beautiful faster? And who can do it? And yeah, we, we often turn to the effects department and say, hey, this is our problem. You know, we've tried it here. This is gonna take X number of weeks and you know we don't have that much time we have half that time so what can you pull yeah. together how can you automate this you know can you can you build a tool to make this faster and get the same result and yeah, yeah and usually it works out um i, I had a, a student i was talking to the other day and you know talking about interview questions and you know what's a you know do you have a time that you you know, didn't have a solution for a problem. And we're laughing because because he's like, no, <laughs> there's, there's always a solution. When you think of someone working in Houdini or, or an effects artist, like you're almost taught that there is a path, even if it's not a straight path from A to B, there's always some sort of way to find a way to do it. And oftentimes you turn to, to Houdini and, and effects artists to do that. So 
Um, no, that's, that's awesome. Um, do you think any, um, do you anticipate any kind of exciting new technologies in the world of effects in the future that students should look out for? Well, uh, I definitely think, you know, uh, there's some interesting developments in, in real time, uh, simulation and, and things using the graphics card, that stuff is really impressive to look at. There's a few different softwares out there. Some are standalone, some are in, you know, packages like nuke. Um, I think those are really exciting, although they do have their limitations. So, you know, whilst they look impressive and wow, I can simulate that thing in real time. Um, sometimes the limitations that they put on those, on those simulations can sort of be contrary to what you want to get out of it. At the end of the day, you know, you're trying to realize a particular effect or some sort of artistic direction that you've been given. And sometimes if there's limitations, then it makes it difficult to, to kind of, you know, achieve that result. Maybe it's the, the look can't be changed that much or, you know, the way that it simulates the fire is always the same and you can't, you can't really change it. Um, so I, I look forward to those things getting better and, and being more artistically directable. Um, I, I think, I think that would be amazing because we do spend a lot of time waiting, you know, in effect, you, you, you set up your effect and you hit simulate or, or render or whatever it is. And, and you wait. Uh, now when we're <laughs> working, when we're working at home, you are waiting and you, you, your computer's tied up and you just have to go to bed or, or go and have dinner or something and hope that it's done when you get back, uh, in a studio, you can send it off to a render farm and then continue on doing another task. But you know, there, there are times when you could be waiting 24 hours for something to turn around and that is a huge amount of time. So. And, and, you know, making changes, if someone goes, oh, I don't like that bit, can I, can I get another version? And you're like, like well, <laughs> yeah, but I'll, I'll see you in two days, you know. Um, and, and directors and supervisors don't really love to hear that sort of thing. So I think anything yeah. that can make, make our, our work faster. Um, obviously, yeah, Houdini has OpenCL, which has made a big improvement to our, our simulation times. Um, but yeah, I, I think those real time kind of uh, platforms are, are really interesting and something that I definitely keep an eye on. Uh, I also think, you know, the crossover between games and film is a really interesting uh, area where you're seeing things like virtual production, uh, where, you know, they're using things like Unreal, generating assets in Houdini or environments, even effects, and then bringing them into the real time environment, using them as backgrounds. Um, the, the Mandalorian uh, making of videos really impressive in the way that they use that real time environment and the sort of light stage that they had set up to, uh, to, to film. Um, I, I thought that was, that was incredibly impressive. And that's something that I am looking into more and more now, because I think increasingly that will that will just be, you know, something that's going to be used, especially in this current climate where you cannot have uh, a lot of people on set. Maybe you can't go to that location that you wanted. Why not just create it, uh, you know, in, in Unreal or in Houdini mm -hmm. and, and then display it in real time behind the actors as they're present on set. Um, I, th I think that's, that's pretty exciting. And, and I definitely think we'll see more and more of that. Yeah, I've definitely heard a lot of um, people talking about that. And there's a lot more job opportunities for people who know Unreal as well. So that's really exciting. Um, yeah. But just to touch on on rendering, everyone's least favorite topic, because uh, <laughs> you made me think of something. Um, do you have any tips for, and I know this varies depending on if someone's at a studio or at home, but do you have any tips for people on how to better forecast their render time or how long something will take for them to do, um, like getting better at self estimation. Yeah, I look, that's that's a tricky that's a tricky thing. It's a it's a skill, uh, I guess, that you need to learn over time as you uh, as you do more things. You you sort of start to develop an understanding of how long certain things take, and you know you can better estimate. And I still struggle with it when I'm, you know, quoting on jobs. And you you try to make your best estimate, 
and sometimes you can overestimate which is great uh but sometimes you can vastly underestimate and that's bad because yeah that's um, the big problem one <laughs> yeah. uh, i think you know it, it's important to really evaluate everything that um you know you you think you might be doing so you know if you if you're going to do an explosion or something like that then you need to really write down or think about the tasks that are going to be involved um all of those little elements you know rather than coming up with them on the fly try and itemize them and say okay so i've got an explosion i'm going to you know need the explosion obviously but then maybe i need a shock wave and i need some trails and i'll need dust now the mm -hmm. explosion if i want that if that's going to be sort of close to camera it's going to need to be really high resolution so that you know it's hard to say without having any experience in it but you know having done a few explosions in the past i know that they take several hours to complete so i know that this is going to take me you know the best part of a day to set up probably and then it might take me another day to kind of simulate the thing and get it get it done then all those other elements are going to be probably another day or half day you know so every one of those things you can kind of start to assign a little time to so that's why it's important to write them down from the start so that you can try and work out you know how much each one of these tasks is going to take maybe the explosion takes two days then the shockwave might take a day trails another day and then rendering you have to kind of start doing some tests and i always do low resolution the half resolution renders uh before i have sign off so you know especially at a studio as well is we never render full res um quite often a lot of the time we'll send half res to clients because the difference in quality is not that great there's a there's a little bit of clarity that comes from it but the difference in quality is is not enough to make that extra time worthwhile until we have sign off and then we can go okay let's go full res we'll put it through comp and get it get it done um, I, I think that's a big one, you know, when you're working as a student or, or working by yourself at home is you have to kind of, you know, you have limited resources. So you, you do kind of need to just wind things back a little bit. Um, and if you want to see things in a decent amount of time, just, you know, just turn down the quality a little bit, have a little bit of acceptable noise in there. Obviously, it's too much. You can't read it. So you just need to find that, that happy medium. Um, mm -hmm. But when I jump into a file, I always just turn all the settings down to, you know, down to very low so that I can get a feel for the effect, see the render, judge lighting, things like that. If I'm always rendering full quality, I'll be waiting for days and days every time I want to make the change. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to kind of um, just, yeah, wind all that stuff back, especially at the development stage. Um, but yeah, it's a, I guess it's a difficult thing to, you know, to judge without having done it before, how long something will take. But I think it's important to just itemize everything and, and try and work out roughly how long something will take. And then see if you see if you did it, see if you stuck to it. You know, yeah. you, could, you could practice it in your personal projects and just see how long things take and make a note of it. And then next time you go to do it, maybe you do it a little bit faster. Um, certainly when you're coming up with things, you know, that you've never done before, that can take a long time because you kind of get lost in the adventure of putting down nodes and trying things out and that that can certainly be a massive time sink yeah yeah and and i think um that that's something that as a as a producer i thought was super valuable any artist that i've worked with who was able to estimate their time even if it wasn't exact but to have that little bit of yeah. you know ability to say, okay, I think it's going to take this long. And if they do it faster, amazing. You know, when they, when they learn also to tell me like, you know, tack on a couple more hours <laughs> just in yeah. case, um, you know, depending on who you're talking to, whether it's your lead or if it's someone higher up in production, um, that's a skill that normally comes with time and age and experience in the industry. So the sooner you start to have those skills as a student to start keeping track of your time, you're going to be miles ahead of uh, the rest of the people you work with, especially if you, you know, get a junior position or an entry level position. Um, a lot of people don't really start thinking about that until they get to, you know, the lead position or the supervisor positions. That's when they start bidding stuff and and estimating time on, you know, large quantities of shots and, and, 
everything. So no, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and just, just to let everyone know here who's still watching, uh, it looks like we still have a full house. That's awesome. Um, please feel free to send us um, some questions here. You can e either send it to everybody so everyone sees the question, or if you want to send it just to us, you can change it to uh, send to admin only, and it'll be anonymous, and then I'll just ask it. Um, I have a couple of questions um, for Julie as well here. Um, so one of the things I wrote down as, as you were presenting um, so with that blue sky internship example, so the person who got an internship and then asked if, um, you know, he could do the, the hair and fur sim on his own and use Houdini instead and they let him and then that turned out to be awesome. Then they ended up using Houdini. Um, that's such an inspiring story. Um, however, I've also seen the opposite happen and it was really sad because I talked to the artist and I was like, yeah, you should go for it and, you know, talk to your lead, see if we can use a different program for that. If, if you think it's more efficient, um, but it, I don't want to say backfired, but in the end that artist was not allowed to use that program and they were told to kind of, um, oh, sorry, is that me? Um, told to stay within the pipeline um, for that project. Do, so do you have any suggestions for how to take feedback like that and not let it get you down or take it personally? I think pipeline changes are always a risk and can be painful because <laughs> it's a deep part of the infrastructure. It happened to be probably a couple of things that work with Blue Sky. It was proprietary. Maybe they thought as an intern, you know, like, not a big deal to let an intern try something else. Mm. And they were probably already having some discussions about where they were and the, the heaviness of keeping the proprietary software up. So it may have just have been a combination of good timing, other factors, and, and what seemed like low risk, but then ended up being um, very inspiring. Um, you know, and other times it's just, uh, I, yeah, it could be risky. And so if it feels like someone's trying to insert a new piece of software and not be compliant with things or it's creating more difficulty, you have to be really sure that you're making it more efficient, you know? Like otherwise yeah. you're just inconveniencing <laughs> a lot of people. So I think it's about the risk and maybe you could do some, I don't know, I always find like, what is the low risk way to show some of this? And maybe it is that I make it in Houdini and, and the software that they want and then like, like show them the comparison. Right. And um, mm. if it happens that they say, look, for pipeline reasons, we want this. I can see the point that you're making. Great point. Um, but it's just not what we can do right now. Fair. Right. And um, not all contributions have the right fertile ground. So yeah. um, that is the art of finding when you want to influence change and when uh, change is ready to be taken. Yeah. No, I think that's a great point. And again, it comes back to you know, keeping track of your time, because if you can't quantify how much more efficient this step is, then nobody's going to listen to you. You know what I mean? If you can't tell them accurately, like I have saved six hours. And then if you do that same task every week, like that's, that's a ton of time, right? And that's when people might listen to you. So documentation is big, I think. But if you just go to someone, the supervisor and say, I'm going to do it this way, like, mm. <laughs> That's gonna be tricky. <laughs> I think um, I think one of the issues too is because you're working in a team environment, um, mm. people get sick. You know, people go on holidays, and if you do mm. something outside of the pipeline or something that only you can do, even within Houdini, if you build an effect mm -hmm. that is just so complicated that only you really understand how it works and would take someone days to try and figure it out and unpack Good everything point. that you've done. Mm. It, it, you know, you go on holidays or you get sick and someone has to pick that up and they're just like, I don't know what to do with this. I've I've inherited shots in the past <laughs> where I've just started again because it would have taken me so long and been so difficult to start with that person's work that uh, I just had to do it again to be able to get it done in the time that I needed to. Um, so that's, you know, it's something that you need to consider is that you're you're part of a team. You're not, you're not just, you know, going it alone and, if someone did have to pick it up or if you had to pass it off because yeah. you had to go and work on something else, then yeah, you need to, you need to always think about that. And that's, mm -hmm. that goes back to keeping your files clean and ordered as well and, and labeled, you know, that 
Uh, I'm I'm not the best person at doing that, and I've annoyed a few people by passing off messy files to them. So I always try and try now and, and do it and and notate things and put sticky notes in to help people give them a clue about what's going on. Um, but yeah, it's it's important to you know make sure that you think about everyone else in your in your team as well. Mm -hmm. um, what, so, someone asked, uh, would you say it was too many nodes? <laughs> uh, well. I think you know you do you do end up with a lot of nodes in Houdini depending on what you're doing and it's sort of an organic process of creation that you you may start with just a sphere but then you know you're creating some complex effect and you end up with you know 20 30 50 nodes whatever it might be um I think it doesn't matter if there's a lot of nodes as long as it's clear what is going on and what the process has been um, if it's if it's not clear and there are some things maybe that aren't procedural, manual selection or other things in there that, that just, you know, you really have to know what, what that person was trying to do, um, then that's when it becomes a problem. So it's not necessarily the number of nodes, but just the process and, and the organization of those, you know, those nodes. Right. Um, one of our viewers just asked, um, are there differences in expectation for experience from a technical artist versus a technical director? I feel like those um, are almost two different roles. Yeah, that, they are. I mean, that those the wording of those gets very murky in, in job applications. And I, I feel like some, some recruiters use one where they mean the other. And, you know, it's sort of... Um, yeah, it's a funny, you know, funny kind of term. Uh, I guess a technical artist is more just just what we would call an effects artist, um, perhaps. Um, and and I think the expectation for experience is kind of the same. Um, you know, if you're going whatever level you're going for, if you're going for that junior role, then um, you know the expectation of experience is kind of minimal. Although there's a frustrating thing in in film jobs, certainly where it's minimum three years or one year experience or something like that. And that goes back to what you were saying, Julie, is like, how do you get it? How do you get that experience? You know, if you, yeah, if you've never been in the industry before, how do you, how do you kind of get that experience? Um, but I, I don't think the expectation is different. There are different um, expectations of maybe some knowledge. If you were going for more of a, a TD role, which is more of a kind of, um, I guess a support role for the artists mm -hmm. where you're you're developing tools and in charge of pipeline and integration and, and supporting those artists and getting them, you know, the tools that they need and working well within the rest of the pipeline with the other departments. Um, so there's an expectation of certain uh, other tools that you might need to know, languages like Python and VEX and, and how those integrate into the pipeline. That stuff is um, is something that's different where, you know, those things wouldn't necessarily be expected from your average VEX artist. Um, but yeah, I, maybe that's maybe that's what you mean with experience. Mm. Um, so we have another question from one of the, the viewers here. This one's really interesting. How would you cross over from practical effects to digital? For context, I work on films already and makeup effects and have a decent amount of contacts. How would you mention to them about crossover to the digital world without overstepping from another department? Interesting. I, I, I mean, so I, I have one idea and I think I could see that as almost being a tool to, to say that you have experience doing things practically, whether it's makeup or pr like practical special effects, like actually blowing stuff up live, you know, like practically um, to say that you have that experience means that you know what things should look like in a real world environment. So you could potentially use that in a way to um kind of explain your skills and that you have that background knowledge to potentially pull this off digitally but i think you would probably still need quite a bit of training what do you guys think yeah i, I i've you know i've had people that have asked me this in the past and i sort of uh mentored someone that um you know that that was switching from a practical modeling uh role in film to to a more digital one because he could sort of see the shift happening and he wanted to future proof his, you know, his own career. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's an asset to, you know, have that practical experience because 
and especially on film where we're trying to make things that are real you know what is real and you know how to kind of achieve those things and, and how lighting affects certain surfaces and and what makeup does to that uh, i think that's absolutely an asset and you can take that into the digital realm um uh, you you're right though you do need a lot of training i mean you need to be able to understand how that then transfers and how you can you know, achieve the same things if that's you know if you're looking to do similar things um but you know when when we're looking at lighting and and digital world we we use real principles and we you know if you understand how lights work in the real world then then taking that into a, a physically accurate cg environment is um you know is, is kind of what we are all doing so i think uh overstepping from another department i don't know that's a difficult thing because maybe you don't want to yeah you, you're trying to transition within maybe within the same studio or something and um I think, you know, you just need to let people know that you're passionate about something. If you if you can show someone that you're really into the digital side of things, then maybe they'll kind of, you know, think about you next time they're they're thinking about, oh, we need someone to do this. And maybe you just develop your your skills and your your reel or your portfolio uh in you know in your spare time and then just start showing it to people and and then they'll think about you hopefully and, and maybe give you give you a chance um you just need someone to give you yeah. a chance in this industry that's, that's what it's all about yeah and and you never know when those those contacts from your you know original job or, or whatever you've done before you never know when those will come in handy in the future they may not seem relevant right now but you know your contacts um in, in the practical effects world might think of you in the future when when they need something done digitally they'll say oh well i know so and so and and i know that they started taking this course and you know i should call them because i've worked with them before and at the very least i i trust their work ethic so people that you know from a previous life previous kind of field um they will trust your work ethic and that's something that um it is very hard for people to trust in complete strangers. So, you know, you never know when, when those things can cross over. And if people trust you already, then that's something that's a huge asset for you in the future. Um, one thing I wanted to ask um, Julie, um, you mentioned that being open to change is an important quality to have. Side effects comes out with new tools and upgrades super often. Um, do you have any advice for students and professionals on how to keep their skills up to date? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, you guys probably feel the same about this, that if you're not going to keep learning, you'll be antiquated so fast in this industry. You have, to, it's, it's a, it's an amazing thing because a lot of the people that I work with uh, always feel youthful and it's because they have to keep learning. Um, so how do you do that? Well, you have to, I guess, master um, how to be self-directed with your learning. So once you're done school, you have to figure out like, how do I keep learning part of my habit or easy in my environment to do? And it might be that I just sign myself up for an online course and I just keep that going like I always make sure I always take an online course it might be that I'm better peer-to-peer -peer and I make sure that anyone in the studio that I see who's doing better work than me I look over their shoulder and I learn from them it might be um, as an artist I, I feel like there's always this tension between am I making what I make because it's what I can do or it's what I think the best outcome and product would be and that tension mm -hmm. usually is indicative of if I'm playing it safe I'm not learning enough um, and that you have to stay true to the thing like are you settling on something and sometimes you do because you have to get a shot done and that's it but still you have to think about that feeling and say am I now compensating because I don't have the technical skill and so I think mm -hmm. that, that that ruthless honesty with yourself and then just doing the committed work by the time you're in school you've already practiced uh, committing to action to learn and so keeping that momentum up and not, um, I don't want to say lazy, but, but just um, not, not exercising that skill is when you lose it. No, that's fantastic. Um, we have time for maybe like two more questions. Um, so we have one here from Scott. 
I have over 25 years at a senior level in various disciplines in design. So I have a ton of life experience and possess a lot of the traits of working within a team and problem solving, et cetera. How does this translate to a job, entry level, mid level, et cetera, as I'm developing my skills? Um, any ideas here? Uh, I mean, I think, you know, it, it's difficult, I guess, you know, when you, you do have a lot of skills in another discipline and then you're trying to translate that because at the end of the day, they the person that's hiring you, they still want those core Houdini skills or, or whatever it might be. So that is probably going to determine what your entry role is going to be. But I think if you can display those kind of traits when you get in, then you can probably, you know, get to your desired role a bit faster because you you know you do work well with the team you maybe can solve problems in in creative ways and mm. i think if you can demonstrate that stuff quickly and and you know be proactive i think you know the most successful artists are the ones that are proactive and say i can i can do that or, or can i you know can i help with that or 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 solve problems quickly and um those are the ones that are going to you know that are going to rise up through the various roles um maybe more quickly than someone that's just kind of you know plodding away keeping their head down and and you know not not really sort of um speaking up or trying to take on extra work um yeah I, I, it's a difficult thing i, I guess um yeah what one thing that i because we have a lot of different types of students here at the school and different people I've met over the years um, that are in different positions at different stages of their lives. You know, like you can sometimes have a manager who's super young because they just started early and they had one focus from the time that they finished high school and they've just stayed in that field. And then you have other people like I started as an artist, then I moved to production. Um, what I like to tell everyone, it doesn't really matter what field you're in, whether it's, Houdini or anything, nobody can really take that experience or that knowledge away from you. Um, so you have to find a way to use that knowledge and your previous experiences to move forward in your new career. So whether you have a good eye for design and that could make you a more um, creative Houdini artist versus someone that's more on the technical side who doesn't have a good eye for design. Um, that's a valuable skill that some other people might not have because they don't have the, the amount of years of training their creative eye. Um, so instead of thinking of things like, you know, I'm doing this job now and this job later, it's good to kind of, especially once you get that interview or, or whether it's in a cover letter to kind of explain that, the experiences you've had before or the positions you've held, even if they're not in an industry, even if you're working at, at a store somewhere, um, there are so many relevant skills um, and transferable skills that you could bring with you to this new job. So, you know, you're in senior level um, positions, managing a team, that's something that comes really in handy when you're working at a studio. And so even if you start kind of more at the entry level or, or junior level position, like Daniel said, you could work your way up a lot faster because you're someone who does know how to work with people. You do know how to work with a team um, and some other people might not. So yeah, I think, I think um, it's definitely a, a bonus and it's not something that um, needs to like, you know, stop you from doing that. Cool. Um, so I think that's it. We've been here for about an hour and a half. Time flew by. Um, if anyone has any other questions for our presenters here today, um, please feel free to email me. I'm going to drop my email right here. Um, edu.au. I have the longest name ever. There we go. Um, please feel free to email me any additional questions you might have and I'll call it everything together over the next few days and I'll talk to Julie and Daniel and get some answers for you and I'll send them back in an email to all of the people who registered today. Um, so thank you everyone so much um, for coming. Thank you, Julie. 
Thank you so much um, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Daniel. I hope you have a wonderful morning today in Australia. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a wonderful night or morning wherever you are. Thank Thanks, you very guys. much. See you later.